The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. How, what is the evidence of carnality in our life is personal sin. Personal sin unconfessed. And 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. And so 1 Peter 2 says that once you're saved, you're a believer priest in the, under the new covenant. And uh, it's a privilege and a responsibility to confess your sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins, but whatever it is, the Holy Spirit has convicted you. Your conscience probably has convicted you. <clears throat> so you're under a double uh, judgment in regard to carnality and confession of confession of that sin will bring you back into spirituality and that's how you study the Bible that's why it's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living so I give you a moment to do that confess your sin in silence and privacy through your priesthood so that you can be under the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit as a believer if you're an unbeliever then the issue is the gospel which means that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. And if you believe it, you will be saved. That's what Romans 1.16, believe the gospel, and the gospel is the power of God to save you. So we'd like to have everybody be able to study the dynamics of the Bible tonight with us. So, Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and Internet on this Thanksgiving 2018 and while many times we just you know we've got people from out of town coming in and tomorrow is Thanksgiving Day and so there's a lot of baking and a lot of shopping a lot of stuff going on uh, for families coming in at, at this time of the year and ours is no different <clears throat> Maybe the whole source of Thanksgiving is about the church. Maybe we've, we've grown to see it as a national holiday and not a spiritual holiday. <clears throat> and of course it is. It's both a national and a spiritual. And so we come tonight, Father, with thankful hearts. Tomorrow we'll eat great meals and hope not sin with gluttony, but we'll eat like Americans in a nation of great prosperity. Well, many in the world will go hungry and there will be nothing to give thanks for because they don't know the God of manna. They don't know the God of manna. The story of the children of Exodus if you've got God, you got everything. If you don't have God, you have nothing, no matter how many things you have. And so we want to tell you how thankful we are tonight, both out of the word of God and out of our own human experiences, because we're, we, are, we come tonight with great thankful hearts. And so encourage our hearts tonight, Father, and maybe those who are tuning in with us tonight, Amidst all of the hustle and bustle of thanksgiving, we would not forget that it's called thanksgiving, the giving of thanks. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin. I gave you a card. I want to do something with you. I want everybody to participate, if you would. I want you to open your Bibles to Psalms 100. That is the thanksgiving Psalms. There's only five verses in it. That's not going to be my study, but it's going to be part of it. And I don't know if you have built tradition around Thanksgiving, but here would be one like, you know, you may have a tradition where you read the Christmas stories, you know, you read the Christmas story at the Christmas time and meals and gift giving. And this is a Psalms. This is a Thanksgiving Psalms. This is the Thanksgiving Psalms, 100. There's five verses. And I, I want you to look at five, you know, we always look for markers. I'm going to show you five markers 
There are only five verses, and there are five words that make these five verses dynamite. And so I just want you to, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to read it all, but I, I just want you to look at five words, and sometime in your quiet time uh, over the holidays, read this Psalms 100. Or if you have a meal, this is a great Psalms uh, before you have your prayer to read this Psalms and maybe to remind people to look at five key words and then have prayer and eat, uh, the word shout, the word worship, the word know, K-N-O-W, and the word enter. If you, if you just quickly look, the word shout is in verse 1. The word worship is in verse 2. The word know is in verse 3. The word enter is in verse four, and the word four, F-O-R, is in verse five. So when you get to verse five, he, he's making a summary, a conclusion. Uh, Psalms 105. Does your King James have that? Psalms 100. No, 100. There. there 100 and there are five verses. Yeah, wasn't jiving. Well, we want to be sure we're on the same page. Okay, okay good. You see, the now I'm, I pull my five words out of the New American Standard. Look at verse 1. You got the word shout. Noise. Noise is all right. Uh, verse 2, you have the word worship. Serve. Serve, mm -hmm. word worship, that's okay. In uh, three, you got the word know, K-N-O-W. In four, you got the word enter, and then you have a conclusion, four, right? And then he makes a summary. And, and notice how it's titled. I think everybody, if you have a study body, everybody is going to have the word Thanksgiving at the top of it, right? I mean, this is the classic. Okay, call to praise, giving thanks, praise or giving thanks. It is a giving thanks psalms, okay? And uh, when you look at those, those key words and then a conclusion of it, uh, it is about worship. Uh, it is about, it's about thanksgiving, um, and, and assembly, uh, you know, it could be it could be an assembly in the church. It could be assembly in the house. It could be assembly wherever you are, right? And uh, so you know, the shouts the idea is not holler, but but I mean, you could do this in silence, couldn't you? Uh, it it is an exclamation. It's it's what you're proclaiming. It it's what you're so thankful about. And he starts, starts with that in verse 1 and then moves, moves through a series of ideas on that that's old covenant. But it, the, the main words are the key for us. Okay, so there's your great psalms. It's Psalms 100. It is the Thanksgiving psalms. And it's, 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 it's what we read at our home uh, before our meal. And, and then... We do something similar to what I'm going to do with you during the meal. We may not do it at the beginning, and we may do it at the end. But we go around the table, and t everybody tells one thing that they're very thankful for. And some people, you know, that some people walk in. Uh, they're not traditional like we are. <clears throat> See, the old heads that know that what this is going to be, they come up with one. You can see the people who don't have that in their heart. They, they start to scramble. You know, I, oh, it's, I'm third one. What am I going to be thankful? And so you can begin to see people. Look, and why do we do that? And why am I going to do this tonight with you? Because you should always have a thankful heart. You shouldn't have to stop and think about it. That should be on the top of your list, shouldn't it? There ought to be, always be something that you're just so thankful for to God. And so 
Here, here's, what I, uh, here's what I want you to do with your three by five card. Uh, I want you to write down one thing that you're thankful for this Thanksgiving. Over this past year, hopefully, now you may have to go, you may want to go back further, but over this last year, as we close this year, we're coming down. When you get to Thanksgiving, we're coming to close this year down. You stop back and you look at your year and evaluate it. And I'm not looking for a long, thoughtful idea here. I'm thinking, what is the first thing that pops in your mind that you're thankful for? That's, you know, I didn't give you this a week ahead of time for you to do it, which is a good idea to write down at the close of a year. I do it monthly. I write a journal, though. So I can go back. I can look and I can, I make a point. <clears throat> but. I want you to write down one thing that you're thankful for this year. One thing that you're thankful for. I, I, and it, I, I can remember well one of them at, at the meeting when we had in our home. Uh, we had just lost a patriarch in the family. You know what I mean? And And... I had thought a lot about after his death and his funeral. I had thought, that, I mean, this man was on my mind all the time, periodically, you know what I mean? I would come up and I would, and, and, it, and divine principles would be attached to this man because he was a godly man. <clears throat> and um, so w when my tank came around, I mentioned this man and I mentioned what I was so thankful about and how it had captured my uh, attention over a pretty good span of time from his death to this time, you know? And I still think about it. I mean, there are days when I still think uh, about it. And I mentioned that as one of the things I was thankful for. And it just kind of looked, opened a Pandora box in that group. And it wasn't necessarily that everybody had something to say about that man. But I'll tell you what was interesting. They all had said, can I come back and say something that somebody had already been around? And they said, could I come back and say something? And it was amazing to me how that whole, and everybody, everybody, every, everything shifted. Isn't that interesting? And it was one of the most awesome times. And the kids still talk about that. You remember that year? I mean, it's kind of interesting what God can do in something that you just think is so, oh, I don't know, maybe wrote in some ways, you know, now I lay me down to sleep kind of thing. And, and so, but I want you to write, I want you to write it down and, and I want you to, I want you to write down, after you write it down, I want you to write Psalms 100. Because this is where it happened. I want you to sign your name and date it. Put the date. This would be twenty. This would be eleven twenty one. Eighteen. And. Here's what I want you to do with it. I want you to put it in Psalms 100, Psalms 100 in your Bible and leave it. Leave it. You will be amazed what that will do for you. You will be amazed. You will be amazed what that will do for you. I did that, <clears throat> and I carried that thing around forever. And when I'd have one of those funky days, I'd open, I'd go to my Bible, and my Bible would open with that card in it. You know how, you know how that, <laughs> and I'd re I'd read that card. It was just times one hundred. And I go like, "What are you? What are you whining about? What are you whining about? Gee whiz." Okay, that's yours. That's personal. 
That's yours, right? That's that's very personal. That's yours. And uh, you let it speak to your heart over over a period of time. And and you you may listen. You may add one thing within it. When Thanksgiving's over, don't touch that card again. You may add something before the Thanksgiving meal is over. That's okay. Leave it alone. Just leave it alone. If you want to do this again, do it with another card in another place. <laughs> this is this is our place. <laughs> okay. So now you have a. I'm I, I'm going to do First uh, Timothy tonight with you, and we'll go home with thankful hearts. I want to be sure you do something. Not just at Thanksgiving. I want you to do something every day, every time you eat. Every time you eat. Every time you eat. Every time you say to yourself, <clears throat> listen to me, every time you say to yourself, I'm a little hungry. You hit the refrigerator. I want you to do this. Every time you sit down at a formal meal, you know, like, well, this is my breakfast, this is my lunch, this is my supper. I want you to do this. But I also want you to do it every time you think you're hungry and you you reach up there and get whatever your comfort food is. I want you to do this. Because this is what the writer is talking about. In 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy, notice that it's the fourth chapter. I'm in verses 4 and 5. 1 Timothy 4 and 5 is what he says. He says, look at verse 3. First of all, he's talking when he's in this passage, context-wise, there's been apostate teaching on two, on two issues in the church. There's been apostate teaching on two issues, marriage and meals. I just kept, I kept M words. Marriage and meals. Look at verse 3. Men who forbid, forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods, which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. There, were, they were, there, there was an apostasy attack upon marriage and meals. But they kind of go together, don't they? marriage, you know, and family. And so verse 4 and 5, he says, he, we got the word for here. He got like, look, don't be doing that. Look, let me tell you how this thing should be dealt with. He says, for everything, that's a pretty powerful word, everything, for everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected I would I would used to remind my kids at the table, those peas. Those peas came from God, and you got to learn that they're good. So we had to dress them up a lot. We should be thankful that we have them, right? So there you go. Nothing be to, to be rejected, if it is received with what. Gratitude. That's that's it. Mm -hmm. It is Thanksgiving. This is, but they're talking about an attitude of gratitude. An attitude of gratitude. So everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected. That that's two things. Number three is to be received with thanksgiving. Five. Four, got another four, got another four. For it is sanctified, set abide as holy, by means of the word of God and prayer. That's why you have the prayer of thanksgiving at meals. So he's talking about, listen, the context is talking about marriage and meals, and he's gone into meals here. Right? Even if it's meals on wheels. You know, he's talking about meals. And he says, everything created by God is good, one. Two, nothing is to be rejected. Three, it is received with gratitude. 
Four, it is sanctified by means of the word of God and what? Prayer. And, and, and what's, listen, you know what the prayer is? You know, what the, you know what's motivating this prayer? An attitude of gratitude. It's an attitude of gratitude. It's, it's receiving it with thankful hearts. I mean, just think, some people don't have refrigerators to go to, and some people don't have anything in them if they went to them. Hmm? Every time you're hungry, that's what we're talking about. That's what meals are about. Every time you're hungry, and every time you say, I'm hungry, and you go get something, you ought to go get it with an attitude of gratitude. You ought to tell the Father. I, I tell you who, who brought this into my life. I've said this before, <clears throat> but it was a guy, a missionary called Sam Bisman. We had Sam here at the church. He was a wonderful guy with the Indians in Mexico. <clears throat> he came home on furlough, wasn't feeling well, and he came home on furlough. He was big friends. He came out of Baraka, and he was good friends with Bertel, his connection with Baraka. And so when he would come home, um, we would, because of my relationship with Bertel, we would share him. He would spend some time over there with him, and then, then he, and then Bertel would send him to me, and he would spend some time with me, and then we'd send him back to. You, you many of you probably remember Sam. Well, Sam taught me this. Taught me this passage out of his own life experiences as a missionary to the Indians, and. I took Sam out to eat. I took him to my favorite, not Chick-fil-A, but my, my true favorite sit down and eat kind of place was Village Tavern. That's my, that's my home away from home. When I leave Chick-fil-A, that's where I go. <clears throat> okay. So I took, I took Sam out there to eat. And of course, he was thrilled about being able to go out and all that. And I told him to order whatever he wanted. So, Look, they brought him a glass of water and asked him, what do you want to drink? So he ordered his drink. I mean, who prays over that? I mean, who, who, who even thinks to pray? We prayed over it. We prayed over the drink. It's clean water. You have no idea. I mean, he was so thankful to be able to have, it had ice in it, and it was fresh, and it was clean. Didn't have to boil it before he drank it. I mean, I didn't stop to think of that. I said, he said, let's have a word of prayer. I, I thought, okay. Then they bring the meal. Let's pray. Bring the meal. I said, you want dessert now or later? He said, it's up to you, Ron. I said, well, let's just go ahead. I, there's a dessert here I kind of like. Let, let's, let's just splurge and do it. I said, without, you know, he said, well, I could probably put a little bit back here, but I may I only be able to eat a little because I don't, this is so good I don't want to sin. Well, I ain't even thought about that. Let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> let's go for it and confess our sin, buddy. So um, he goes like, and I said, yeah, they'll, they'll, we can, we've got a takeout. We can do takeout on it. He said, okay. So, of course, they bring us dessert. What do we do? We pray over it. Pray over it. And, uh, and not only that, but he's talking to the waiter through this whole thing. He's talking to the waiter about the Lord. Talks about the later. Every time the waiter comes, he's got to capture it off. I said, boy, you're really getting after him, aren't you, Sam? He said, yeah. He's a, he's a captive to me. Man, what are you going to do? He can, man, he give me somebody else, I'm going to do it to him too. He said, you got to take advantage when you got him, you got him in your lock, man. You got him in your sights. You didn't let him off the hook. I mean, look, I, I didn't know this man when I walked in here, but God does. He just introduced us to it. And so, <laughs> I mean, he wore this guy out. I mean, he wore out. And I thought, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Why don't I do that? Man. 
what's wrong with me? Yeah, he's absolutely right. Why don't I do that? And I said to him, I was curious to see where he's coming from, what doctrinal background he was coming. I said, well, Sam, I, I see what you're doing. What is it? He said, First Timothy 4, 4 and 5. He said, it's become the major thing of my life. He said, I do it. I'm, I'm, he said, I'm on a mission field where you better be praying because you better not be eating and without it. But you'll get, you'll get sicknesses that cause you to die. And I hadn't thought about all that. I just, just spoiled American. Spoiled by grace, you know, without a thankful heart. So he taught me a whole, a whole new system of thinking about things. I mean, I know you probably went, oh, yeah, when you go to the refrigerator because you're a little hungry. You want me to give thanks? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. I do because I think God does. You ought to be appreciative of how much we have in grace. How much we have in grace. I mean, we have no idea how wealthy we are until you meet a guy like Sam who really lives among dirt poor people who love God. Didn't even know anything about gardening until he got there. He said, then not one of you that go to my church is ever going to be hungry again. And I'm going to tell you how we can solve that. Taught him how to, how to do a garden. Do a garden. Well, God bless him. So, that's how, so here we are. We're in this lesson. I want to look at point one. Listen to me. You need a little history about having an attitude of gratitude. Before Adam sinned, before Adam sinned, meals were on the basis of grace without adversity attached to them both by work and diet. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, you guys know that. Without work or diet. Where did all this stuff come from? Sin. As soon as Adam sinned, we, we, we got in a peck of trouble. Now you got to work, right? You got to work, you, you, you know, you got to toil. The ground is under a curse. Yeah. You got to really be smart to, to, to get a hundredfold out of a ground that's cursed. And if all the ground is cursed, how do you find good ground? Is that all the earth cursed? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I, and you know how we know the whole earth is cursed? Genesis 9, the rainbow. If you read this whole 17 verses that he talks about it, you will see that principle. But here's another one. On day three of creation, Genesis 1, 9 through 11, meals consisted of what we today would call organic. It would be perfect organic. Organic vegetables and fruit given by God by his grace program. Right? Of course. They were, they were created good. They were created good. If you read verse, if you read the day three, he's going to say good. On day six, Genesis 1, 24 to 31, God said, behold, listen to what he says now. I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be, for, it shall be food for you. There was their diet, right? Established on when? Day three. And who is he talking to on day six? Man, right? Man is created on day six. He creates, listen, God is always ahead on his grace provisions ahead of you, right? Day six, day six, man, man is behind the curve. But God has set the whole thing up, hasn't he? I mean, you must never forget this lesson. The difference between day three and day six. When it comes to God, we'll take care of your needs. He's so far out ahead of you. You keep saying, where's God? Where's God? Listen, he's so far ahead of you. He's waiting on you. He's, wait, 
<laughs> he's up where you ought to be. He's just waiting on you. <laughs> he's so good. I mean, how, how is it that people don't love God? <laughs> he's so good. Here's the second thing we need to know historically. In the post-Diluvian world, that is the world after Noah's flood of Genesis 6 through 9, God changed man's diet to include meats. Now, I, I, everybody gets nutty in a fruitcake in our day. Fruitcakes are in, by the way. Uh, <laughs> except, except when they're human. Um, now, listen, in the ninth chapter, the first four verses is kind of important. But in like verse three or so in there, it says every moving thing that is alive. Th that now we're in Genesis nine. We're, we're, we're after the flood business. He says, every moving thing, we're in the post-Diluvian period, post-Diluvian, after the flood, every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. Now watch this. Watch this great line. We're in our civilization. The, we live in the post-Diluvian world. This is our world. He says, it shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant only do not eat flesh with its life in its blood. In other words, don't, don't participate with blood. You can have the meat, but not the blood. You understand? And listen, he makes a, he, he makes a reference from nine to the antediluvian world. It's a, who took care of you? Listen to me. You're missing this. Who took care of you in the antediluvian world? God. And how did he keep you, how did he keep you healthy after sin? But the word of God. He told you exactly how you should eat, right? Listen, after the flood, there was a whole dietary change in the human race. Please tell me you understand that. Now they can add what to their diet? Now we have meat and potatoes and, and uh, well, something green. He, he talks about green, doesn't he? Yeah. I, gave, I gave the green plant to you. Don't forget the green plant. Broccoli. Yeah, broccoli, uh, peas. I tell the kids, peas. <laughs> but listen, have meat, but you can't, you can't, you don't, you, the blood is not in your diet, right? That's, that's forbidden. And why? Shadow Christology. Shadow Christology. We know that. We know that from Gen Genesis 4 when the two boys go out and they bring their offerings to God, Cain and Abel. Well, okay. And, and then I wrote down a passage, two passages that would go with this out of the New Covenant, uh, and that would be or Leviticus 17, 10 through 13, which is talked about again in Hebrews 9, 22. Those, those, if you link those three things, it would be, be, be beneficial to you. The doctrine, this is also, this is, this is, I want you to put your eyes on this one, though. But it says that, I said, the doctrinal principle this doctrinal principle of diet was placed in the final draft for unity of doctrine in the early church at Jerusalem. Whoa. I, I mean, th this, this lit up my life when I, when I read that. I'm in, a, I'm, in a, I'm in Acts 15, 19 through 21. Look on your paper. This is their final draft. Now, they're in a transitional period, but this is their final draft. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essential four things. That you, abstain, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from things strangled, same idea, and from fornication. Look, they reach all the way back into that Levitical. Now, they're reaching back to Le Leviticus, but Leviticus is reaching all the way back to the post that we were in the post diluvian period. See, that reaches all the way to back to Genesis Genesis 9. So Genesis 9 is the proof text for Leviticus 17, which is the proof text for the for the discussion in Hebrews 9:22. It's just kind of interesting. And of course, this is the transitional period. Listen, Acts 15, we don't do this today. Because Acts 15 is in the transition of the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. As soon as the New Covenant is established in 100 AD, then we're out of that. But here, 
I don't know if I wrote this down, but here would be a couple associate passages like Hebrews 9, 8. Did I? And then 10th chapter 19. And 20. Oh, God. I spoil you people. I write all this on my paper, and then I don't know if I ever go back and put it on print for you. But these would be very good for you. Later, now listen to me. Now we're, in now we're once the church gets established, we're, we're, we're working pretty good. Later, Paul will explain how to apply the law of expediency. Now, the law of expediency is about how the Christian deals with unbelievers about views about life and God. We call that the law of expediency. You know, there's the law of love and the law of expediency, etc. Later, Paul will explain how to apply the law of expediency with these four things to the new covenant Gentile believers. He does it in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10. All three passages, all three chapters are important. I, I'm going to go, and, and you go read that, and you can see the whole argument that Paul has. I wrote down Colossians 2, 16 and 17. Listen to what Paul says. Because there's so much controversy. There's so much controversy. That's what, that's what he's talking about in 1 Timothy. There's false teachers on marriage and food, right? Marriage and meals, right? So he was battling this apostate thing. Listen to what he did. Now, there are five things he lists here that are old covenant that are kaput. Get rid of these. Listen to what he says. Therefore, no one should act as your judge in regard to the following things. One, food. Two, drinks. Three, respect to festives, festivals type thing. Uh, four, new moons. Five, Sabbath day. Who is to be the judge? The word of God called new covenant. New covenant doctrine. Things which are mere shadows. That's it. See that? Sh shadow Christology. Things which are mere shadows of what is to come. What is to come? The substance belongs to Christ. And when Christ comes in and establishes his church, we are in a full bloom operation of new covenant thinking. And this is true about marriage and it's true about males. And that's my subject tonight. Also, you should uh, later on your time read Hebrews 8, 5 through 8, and 10, 1, which talks about the shadow, the shadow teaching, that old covenant doctrine fulfilled in Christ. And I didn't come to abolish it. I came to fulfill it. Now, point number three, and, and we'll go home early, maybe. <laughs> We're anticipating it anyhow. In 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, I, I, and I broke it down on your paper, Paul issued three important reasons for new covenant thanksgiving grace at every meal. And that's, that's what I'm trying to convince you about. And don't give me God knows my heart business. But God knows my heart. Boy, if, if you lived your life in that, you'd be pure as snow, white snow, driven winter or whatever that the thing goes. But let me tell you what he tells you. He tells you three things. I'm going to come back to where we were in our original opening. First, everything created by God is good. Now, now here's what's important. What's their Bible? What, what's, their can, what's the canon of scriptures these guys are teaching from? O, Old Testament what? Old Testament what? What, what translation? Septuagint. They're pulling it out of the Septuagint. That was, their, that was their main book. Well, this is this Greek speaking. They've been, they've been a, I mean, the Hebrew, become, the Hebrew by now has become a dead language as far as the street. The street language is Koine Greek. Everybody speaks Koine Greek, just like America dominates military, um, money, you know, all the M words. Their Bible, they're like our English Bible, this is what they have. The Septuagint. Now, why is this important? I, I keep telling you this over and over. Do I not tell you this a lot? <laughs> and what, one day you'll get it because you'll actually investigate it. But listen, it's rather than just take my word for it. Listen, the word that's used for good here is kalos. Now, I'll tell you why that's important, why they use it. It's not agathos. See, if I looked at that word and didn't know the Greek language, and I just knew there were some Greek words out there, Say, I would think agathos. If God did it, it must be agathos. God is good. Say, agathos good. 
are you calling, Jesus said to the, the young man, are you calling me Agathos? Are you calling me, are you calling me good? Because there's only one, right? Only one good that's God, and that's God. That's not the word that's used here. The word that's used is kalos. You know where it comes from? The Septuagint. It comes from the Septuagint. If, 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 if you had a Septuagint Bible, and you can, you can buy one. <laughs> I mean, it's all right. I mean, that's how I got mine. I mean, God didn't hand it to me off on Noah's Ark. You know, I mean, I got it. You know, you can go to Amazon and get one. Uh, so I'm not pushing Amazon, by the way. I could care where you get it. Um, but this word, now look, this is the word. If you go back and you go to Septuagint, say I tell everybody in Greek class, if you really like Greek and you learn it, Get you a sept go buy you a Septuagint because you're going to love that Septuagint because you can read it in the Greek. You don't have to read it in Hebrew. You can read it in the, the Bible that Jesus used. So look, this word is kalos. Every time you see in the English translation of, of Hebrews 1 through the, through the creation story, every time you see the word good, it's kalos in the Septuagint. That Hebrews only had one word for it, and that was tob. The Greeks, they called it kalos. And listen, when you read it, you're going to find this. Now, you're going to find it in your English Bible. You don't pay any attention because you, you read too fast. You don't listen to the still, small voice of God. So you just read too fast. But if you read the whole creation story, you would find that there's one day where you cannot find the word good. Did you know that? Yeah, if you come to this church, you do. Of course, you probably have to come more than once in a while. Did I put it on your paper? Uh, I spoil you people. So I think that would be a gay question for sure. Day two. And you want a great study on your own? Listen to me. You want you just want to have fun with the Bible. Just have fun. I told you this day. You go figure out why that day he said he did he didn't say it was good. He didn't say it's bad, but he didn't say it's good. You pay attention to why he did that. And I didn't, I'm not going to tell you that, because I've told you in the past. But it would be easy for you to figure out. You look at what is what was created on day two that he said it will not be good. He didn't say it would be bad. He just didn't say it would be good. It's just interesting. You see? And so what I see in this is what the English says, it's good, that everything God created. Now, see, he picked the subject up for us on day, day three. He picked up subject for us. He planted, he, he, the diet came out on day three, didn't it? And then it was extended to man on day six. I think all of that's important because I hear such crazy stuff about dieting and what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat. You know what the secret is? Don't overeat, number one, right? God's gluttony. Don't overeat. But you know the second most important thing? I mean, that's censorship in it right there. But the second most important thing is an attitude of gratitude, everything you put in your mouth. Nothing censored. Everything created by God is good. Now, he didn't say by man. <laughs> So, you know, you might you might pay attention to what man puts in it, right? But you know, we lived we lived on a farm. We raised everything. And just about everybody were healthy. I mean, we had colds and stuff, but every had everybody knew the old remedies for everything you got from a farm. We, we never, I never went to the doctor, never went to a doctor. I don't ever remember going to a doctor. I was a teenager when I went to the dentist first time because my grandmother would never allow me to eat anything sweet until I was five years old. I, I ate fruit. All the sugar I wanted, I got from fruit or I didn't get it. And she introduced at the age of five or so, she introduced 
I, on the weekends, she would cook something really up good, a nice big cake or a pie or something like that. Otherwise, I was a, I was a fruit guy. I never, and I never went to a dentist. And the first time I went, I was a grown, I was a grown person. But, but I was a farm person. This is the way we lived. We lived. We lived off from the earth. Uh, and so when it says everything that God created is good, that's the way we live. It's the way we live. And, uh, but that's number one. Number two, <laughs> nothing is to be rejected. See this word? It's apo. That's a preposition on the front of it. And that bleptos comes from balo, where the, ball, the word ball comes from. And it means to throw, this word means to throw away. When you put those words together, it means to throw away, reject, or refuse. Reject's a very good word for that. Um, it's and and I like the idea that they used it with a ball. It's thrown to you. God threw you your diet. He gave you air, and, and and therefore it should be. That's what you should pay attention to. Right. So don't throw that away. But don't get goofy about all this stuff. Well, you know, they they live to be a thousand years. I hear that. People go like, quit. Well, they lived a thousand years. Well, you could live to be 120. So what what, what are you talking about? Well, and I hear, I say, you know, you, you could live to be 120. Oh, no. Oh, who would want to live to be 120? <laughs> I, I want to live to be 120. I do. I want, I want everything God will give me. I want it all. I mean, what they mean is I don't want to live and be unhealthy. But why don't you start doing something about it now? <laughs> everything, everything that God gives you, everything he's created, everything, everything he's created for you, just make sure that you understand it's what God has created for you, not what man has created for you. That's the only thing you have to be careful about. Why not, why not, listen, why not buy just a little bit more land? Don't take much to have a garden, a garden that you could, that could keep you all winter. And maybe the gun you have to keep other people away, you could go with Don Hunt in one year and you could bag, no telling what you could bag when you go with Don Hunt. I don't know if he'd want you to come along, but I was volunteered. I don't know that I should have done that, but. Yeah, we, whatever you shoot, you got a skin, then you could go with Don. Well, there you go. You know, there was a certain time of the year, my grandfather and I, we would travel a road from our farm to the lake. There was a certain time, I can't remember when I was a kid, it was getting close to the winter months, I think. I can't remember if it was winter or spring. I can't remember that now. But we'd travel the road, and we had a... a a stick, a, a pretty good sized stick, and a, and a probably and and tough, tough wood. I can't remember what kind of wood, but tough wood. And and we were looking for snapping turtles. And they would come out of that. They would come out of that the water, and they would cross that road certain times of the year and certain times of the year, like hours wise. Like my grandfather knew. And we would catch it, and you'd take that stick, you mess with them, and they grab that stick. When they grab the stick, you grab you threw them in the back of the, the, the you threw them in the back of the truck. And we, we would catch these snapping turtles. And my grandmother, I mean, if you brought my grandmother home a snapping turtle, she would love you forever. I mean, she the snapping turtle soup. I mean, the, the, she would talk about how many health remedies are found in it, and if you cook it right, and all that. Uh, my grandfather would have more fun with me as a little kid trying to get that thing out of that shell. And that's a different, that's a different idea. So, you know, it's just, we would go get mushrooms. I mean, we just did a whole lot of stuff. We would go, we'd go out a certain time of the year and, and get mushrooms. And my grandmother would can them. And I, we lived off that stuff. Those are great memories, aren't they? They are for me. I mean, I just, I can float back. I can go back in my head and I can, we go out in Black Forest. Uh, anyhow, 
the third thing is being received with gratitude or thanksgiving. Here's what I want you to see, though. It's really important. There's a, this is part of a, this is a prepositional phrase. See the prep with gratitude or thanksgiving. See that received with that's meta plus the genitive of accompaniment. And and here and here's the added here's here's what the th this is what this means for Ron. It means that you receive what you you have a humble heart to receive what God has given you and you and you have and you have it you, it should be received it should be received with what with accompanied with an attitude of gratitude and i saw that in living dynamics with a guy called Sam Bisman and and listen other people Listen, Sam taught me a lot about, and that when he said 1 Timothy 4, 3, I was familiar with it. It wasn't I was a stranger to that verse, but he gave it a whole new meaning in my life. And I mean, if I'm hungry and I'll go get something, I tell the Father, I'm thankful that I got, I actually got a refrigerator and keep it. I, I got a place. And, and I still have it there. I mean, it, it, I didn't have to eat it all just to make through the day. That I actually had a little surplus out there, a little something. And and I should I should be thankful for that. I should have an attitude of gratitude about it, not take that for granted. And Dad gave me Sam Bisman to keep that picture in my head. You know, and and here's my point. We're going to set some people life, if no more than your grandchildren, if no more than that. I do this with my little grandkids. I do this. I do this. Attitude of gratitude. Attitude of gratitude. Hey, Grandpa, can I have, can I have a little extra? Can I have a, a? We know after it's we check with your mother first, you know, check with your parents first, and then you go, like, yeah, and they go, okay, but look, here's what we do. Attitude of gratitude, buddy. Attitude of gratitude, attitude of gratitude. What's that mean, Grandpa? It means always be thankful for God. Always be thankful that what God gives you. The fact that we have extra, son. You know, the fact that we have extra. It is the it is God has given us so that we, it can be shared. You remember this? That it could be shared with an attitude of gratitude. And so, you know, I'm extending Sam Bisman's principle out of his life into my life and I'm, I'm trying to pass it on to my grandkids my children the people that I think I that they, they pay attention to me that somehow I've become a light in their world I want to be that light for God in their world I want to teach them the little things as well as the big things about life about God I did this with my little two I I, I said mistakenly that my little granddaughter Eve was three and I was informed by her brother that she's only two and she won't be a half until Saturday I went and he's five he just turned five and I go like well excuse me <laughs> but she wanted I said, uh, is it going to be okay with your mama? I said, yeah, it's going to be okay with mother. Mother, it's going to be okay. <laughs> mama says, yeah. Can we go get us? Uh, hmm? Yeah, we can do that. Come on. Listen, I love this. This is, inf this is influence of a child to an adult. I went and I gave it. I said, attitude of gratitude. Attitude of gratitude, baby. Do you know where this comes from? Grandpa, mm -mm, comes from God. Attitude of gratitude. I'm just the I'm just the guy who takes it from God's hand and give it to you. That's all I do, baby. That's all I do. This is not from Grandpa. This is from God through Grandpa's hands to you. I'm just that's. Listen, to what she did. She sang two and a half years old. She sang Amazing Grace to me. She sang the whole song. I'm not sure I could sing the whole song. I'm a chorus guy. No, uh, she 
two and a half years old, and I went, God, you never stop teaching me. You never stop teaching me. I went from San Bisman to, excuse me, when I said a two and a half year, year old girl. It won't be till Saturday. It will not be till Saturday. Let's not jump ahead of this thing, Grandpa. She's still low on the totem pole. She's way down here. Let's not jump her up any. <laughs> influence. It's about how we influence people, adults and children, and how they influence us. And never miss an opportunity for God to speak to your wonderful hearts. Never lose, never lose an opportunity to let him have a moment. Never let him not. I mean, and sometimes the biggest things are in the smallest ideas. That moment has captured my, that what had happened with me, with, with, with Sam Bisman, got captured today with a little girl, almost two and a half. Attitude of gratitude, and she caught that. Two and a half year old kid caught that. I know she's my grandkid, and but I don't know yours yet. You know, I'll get to know them, and I'll have these stories from your life. But she sang Amazing Grace, sang the whole song. A two and a half year old kid sang the whole song of Amazing Grace, and it came instantaneous from attitude of gratitude about God. God gave it to me, I give it to you, I tell you how we got it. And, and she, she breaks out in amazing grace. It don't get better than that, does it? If it gets better than that, I couldn't stand it. That's about as good as it gets in this chain of command. And uh, I'm just so thankful to be a part of that. Father, I'm so thankful to be a part of that. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these who have come our way with us on this Thanksgiving Eve. And our hearts are filled with attitudes of gratitude for you. May we share all of these events with our children and our grandchildren and our best friends and those who we meet casually. It's, it's been a wonderful week in my life. I've, I've seen the hand of God touch me in such special ways. How could I ever thank you for it? Except with an attitude of gratitude. I pray that for all of us. Not, we, not, not miss any of it. Just milk every bit of it in our life, Father. Milk every bit of it. That we not miss any of the great things that you have in store for us. May we have great, a great Thanksgiving with our family. Love on them. We've lost some of them, haven't we, Father, this year? Many in our church have lost really, really influential loved ones. I can remember those Thanksgivings. I can remember those. So we thank you for it. Encourage our hearts, Father, this Thanksgiving to have an attitude of gratitude in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.